Good afternoon, everybody. You know, with uh, with doing shorter church services these days, because we have two and just seems like a wise thing to do to not keep people in a confined space for as much time, and, and that means having shorter sermons, of course. Maybe some of you are, are glad for that, that I don't quite get as much time to say every single thing I might want to say, and maybe that does even make for some better sermons. But sometimes, you know, you just find that uh, you want to say more than you can conveniently say on a Sunday morning. And I think that's especially true uh, with beginning a new season of the, of the church year this Sunday, right? It's the first Sunday of Advent. And this is a season of the year that's just got uh, significant and, and treasured traditions and memories and emotions attached to it. And it's a season of the year that in 2020 is going to look a bit different than, than it has in the past. And so for that reason, I just wanted to put together a short video talking a little bit about what, what I see as the importance of Advent. Now, these are just more my own reflections. Uh, you know, Pastor Heather could probably do it in half the time and, and be twice as deep about the, uh, the theological significance and historical significance of, of the Advent season and explain it maybe far more clearly than I can. But these are just some of the... Uh, the thoughts that have been kind of swirling around in my head, and this is sort of the overflow section uh, for my sermon series, uh, especially this uh, sermon for this coming Sunday. So, uh, you know, if, if you find yourself stuck at home with not as much to do today, I hope uh, that this little video can be a, a source of joy and uh, hope and encouragement to you in this season. Now, you know, I, I truly believe that we need Advent every year at this time. Now, of course, Advent is, and certainly is meant to be, more than just kind of the, the pre-game show lead up to Christmas. But it's not, it's not less than that either. I think Advent helps us to, to keep Christmas well, as Charles Dickens so eloquently put it in, in uh, A Christmas Carol. Advent reminds us and prepares us for why we celebrate Christmas. Look, I like twinkle lights, and trees, and presents, and hot chocolate, and Bing Crosby as much as anybody else, and, and maybe more. I've, I mean, I've been part of so many of Briarcrest's annual uh, Christmas musical productions that I've, I've lost count at this point. Uh, maybe the little kid in me is just more alive than in some people. I don't know. Recently, if you're watching the news, which I kind of don't recommend, but I feel like I'm kind of stuck doing it to figure out what new regulations they're going to be uh, telling us to follow these days. But in, in an interview with America's favorite Grinch, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, CNN's Jake Tapper made a comment to the effect that Christmas just isn't going to be possible this year. Now, on the one hand, I know what it means, and I think probably this week in particular and this weekend coming up, in this community, we're, we're going to feel that, right? Uh, there's no kind of last minute mad dash preparations just out there in, in the Hildebrand Chapel. It kind of looks like it does the rest of the year, just the plain stage. There would be no Christmas musical, no wall-to-wall -wall packed uh, arts and crafts sale out in the lobby. You know, no people coming and going into our small community, and the rest of the month is going to reflect that too, right? No uh, kids' Christmas programs, no kind of standing room only, uh, Christmas carol services, none of that, none of that kind of stuff, you know, trying to pass the flame around as, as you try not to burn down the church building. No, no uh, family gatherings bursting your house at the seams with in-laws and outlaws coming and going and arriving and none of that. And I want to be clear, you know, these things do represent a real loss. Even the schmaltzy hallmark sort of ones, they, they represent a loss in our, in our treasured traditions at this time of year. They represent a loss in our collective memory. And they represent a loss at, at a pragmatic level, I think, just to, to people's incomes, some of whom may not recover, right? This is the time of year that a lot of smaller businesses really depend on uh, for, for business, for sales. Uh, it's the biggest month of the year in a lot of ways, and, and some people might not recover. However, I believe that entering into the season of Advent, and I mean really, really actually digging into Advent, engaging with it deeply, 
probably the one of the best things we can do this December. Advent reminds us that the first Christmas wasn't an easy one either. Think of, think of where God's people were, you know, 400 years of apparent silence from, from the God who had said so many times, I will be their God, they will be my people. Despotic rulers, crippling taxes, government overreach, no room at the inn. And yet, you, you know the story, it came to pass in those days, in, in those days. An old man at his prayers, aching for the, the child that he and his wife never had, and then Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Or, or a teenage girl at her prayer, certainly not expecting the child that she was about to bear. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The ancient words of Israel's scriptures, you know, handed down from bygone ages. I mean, by the time of, of the beginning of the New Testament, the words of Israel's prophets, they were some of them as far removed from those people as, as Geoffrey Chaucer or Thomas Aquinas are from our time in history. You know, we think the Old Testament was ancient, but it was, it was ancient for the people in the Nativity story, too. So they must have thought, is this really going to be coming true now? After, after 400 years, is, is now any more likely to be the time than any other time in our people's history? They'd so often been disappointed in the past. Now, one of the common traditions around the four Sundays of Advent is to focus on the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. 2020 has been a, a tough year. There's been a lot missing from this year. But I can't think of too many things that we need that would really make a difference right now more than these four things. It's been a year where despair seems to be gaining ground over hope. Just think of the statistics that we've heard, you know, put alongside uh, COVID deaths, deaths from overdose, suicide, other, other mental health challenges. It's been a year where anxiety certainly seems a lot more common than peace. How many times have, have you found yourself saying, or at least thinking, well, if this happens and then that happens, what if that happens, right? And then what if this happens, right? It's easy to feel that sense of anxiety. I don't know whether you feel it somewhere in here or you feel it up in here maybe, uh, but we all feel it. And often it's more than just feeling it in our minds. If nothing else, that, that great uh, toilet paper scandal catastrophe hoarding episode uh, back at the beginning of the pandemic should remind us that... Uh, despite what we might like to believe about ourselves, we can be pretty anxious human creatures, right? Levels of anxiety in our population that would probably be considered pathological in normal times. It's, it's definitely a year, I would say, where cynicism just seems to be pushing joy out to the margins. You don't even need to get anywhere close to, to conspiracy theories to feel this one, right? I mean, You've got people, our government, they don't care about us. They're not doing nearly enough to protect us. And then over here, you've got, our, there's a conspiracy. Our government's taken away all our freedoms. It's never going to be the same again. And, and you, wow. Finally, it's been a year where fear seems to be outpacing love. I mean, you can tell people a hundred times a day that staying apart and not talking to one another and keeping your distance is is the loving thing to do, but it, it certainly doesn't feel like it. I mean, we're created to be with other people and, and to actually care in, in the ways that are familiar to us. It goes against our nature to live in this way. And I mean, arguments over masks aside, you know, you, the look on people's faces uh, that you see in public a lot of times, even, even if they don't say anything, and even if they're six feet away from you, and even if you can only see half of their face, that tells a story, doesn't it? And yet, the, these four great truths of, of hope and peace and joy and love have spoken to God's people and to all people throughout the ages in, in various hard times in the past. And they still speak to us today. 
You know, I believe one of the reasons that Christmas continues on the way it does, even in our secular society, even in the kind of somewhat awkwardly, weirdly mutated form that Christmas has, it's that these, these great truths still manage to break through and kind of rise up to a level where we actually pay attention to them at least for a few weeks every December. Now, I don't know the, the first thing about ice skating. I mean, I, I can barely make my way in a counterclockwise circle around, around the arena at public skate time. That's about it. And you know, I've also, I've also forgotten the, the majority of whatever high school physics I once learned. But I mean, I seem to remember something about circular motions and, and angular momentum and people skating around on the ice being a way to illustrate or understand that. Something about centrifugal versus centripetal force or motions. I'm possibly dumbing this down, and I may even be getting this totally wrong. But centrifugal force is, is a circular motion wherein the motion tends to pull to the outside of the circle, whereas centripetal motion is circular motion that, that pulls inward toward the center. Right, the one is like kids playing crack the whip out on, out on the ice surface, right? They form a long chain, and the person at the center gets the whole chain spinning faster and faster until the pull gets stronger and stronger, and eventually somebody can't keep their hands locked together, and then everybody goes scattering off out in all directions. The other is like a figure skater, uh, beginning a spin in place, and then going faster and faster and faster, as she pulls her arms in closer and closer to her body. I think you can probably imagine where this is going, right? There's different kinds of forces at work in our world today, and a lot of the forces at work in our society are more like the kids playing crack the whip on, on the pond. You know, it gets going faster and faster, and the forces get stronger and stronger until somebody just can't hold on anymore, and everybody goes flying off in all directions, probably nursing some, some good bruises in the process. But maybe, maybe there's an alternative. Maybe these old themes of hope and peace, joy and love can, can serve as a counterforce, the one that would pull us all apart, can serve as things that would pull us back toward one another, toward a common center, like that figure skater pulling her arms in and spinning faster and faster towards, towards the center. However, I need, need to make a caveat here. Uh, kids playing crack the whip on the pond doesn't really require much skill. Maybe some, some brute strength, usually from the biggest kid in the middle who's kind of getting that whole circle spinning round and round, but not a lot of skill. Getting to the point where you can execute a high-speed spin while, while wearing a skimpy costume with essentially knives strapped onto your feet. Like, that takes some serious skill to do that well and, and not hurt yourself. And so it is, I think, with these great themes, these great truths of Advent. These are powerful truths, liberating truths, life-giving truths, uh, but not just something we can kind of pick up at will and just know how to make effective use of them, if you will. You know, they, they require considerable, con considerable familiarity and, and even practice in order to see these great truths really start to bear fruit in your lives. In order for that figure skater to move so gracefully across the sheet of ice, right, you don't just put on a pair of skates and go do that one day, right? She's spent hours, you know, skating in the cold, uh, when friends were sitting, you know, warm somewhere, eating a slice of pizza and watching TV. I mean, she's fallen down and, and nursed many a bruise countless times to be able to do that so gracefully and move so gracefully through, through her routine and across the surface of that ice. But eventually it did pay off, and so it is with all of us. I mean, if we want to move gracefully through our lives, and if we want to move gracefully through what is likely to be a weird and maybe challenging season ahead over these next few weeks, 
we also need to push back against some of the things that'd be easier, some of the things that everybody else is doing, maybe some of the things that we'd rather be doing as well, ourselves. And even be willing to fall down and get back up again and keep on going. And this brings us back to Advent being more than just the, the pregame show for Christmas. It's a season of preparation, not unlike an athlete going into kind of an intensive season of preparation and practice before, before an important game or a championship. And like that athlete, we do well to focus on the basics, the essentials in a season like this. In other words, I think it's, it's wise to simplify our lives somewhat in this season ahead. It might even be essential to focus on the essentials. And so Jake Tapper was right. Many well-loved traditions won't happen uh, this December. The threat of COVID-19 and the restrictions surrounding it, they'll necessitate that. But what if some of those restrictions, you know, we can't do this and we can't do that and we can't be running around to a Christmas event or party or get together, you know, 20 nights out of the next 30. Those restrictions might even be the thing that, that points us, that forces us toward greater simplicity back in the right direction. The direction that the themes of Advent had been pointing to all along. The, the, the direction that, that maybe was there all the time and we just kind of forgot about it in the, the hustle and bustle of our busy lives. Perhaps we will learn, like the Grinch did in that, that wonderful cartoon, that Christmas doesn't come from a store. Perhaps we'll learn with Linus what, what Christmas is really all about, Charlie Brown. But we'll take some discipline. I've always been struck with, with the stories my grandparents told about Christmases uh, when they were kids. You know, growing up on the farm in the 30s and 40s, right? The, the Great Depression, Second World War. Times were tough when they were kids. Whatever decorations they had at Christmas were, were mostly uh, homemade from whatever they had around. Um, food was usually good, but some of it you had to be pretty careful with. And, you know, during the war there was rationing, so you might have to save up. You might have to put a little bit of sugar aside for the several months coming up to Christmas in order to have a little extra to make some candy or, or a cake or something. And Christmas stockings were just that, a good pair of socks that didn't have any holes in it that you hung up by your, your actual fireplace that heated your house, not the huge monstrosities that, that we have that we hang up usually by our, our fake fireplaces. And uh, gifts, gifts were simple, you know, a new pair of maybe bright red mittens that mom knitted while kids were at school and she had a few spare moments here and there. Practical, nothing fancy, but maybe, maybe filled with more love than all the latest electronic gadgets that that we hand out just so, so liberally and so willingly today. Now, nowadays, we'd certainly call where my grandparents and many people in the past grew up, we'd call that poverty, deprivation. And yet, families gathered together and they, they sang of the, the joy that they had accompanied, if they were so fortunate, maybe by a beat up old guitar or an out of tune piano fiddle maybe. Life was hard. People were barely just scraping by in a lot of cases, but they made the best of it. I mean, for many of them, their Christmas dinner had an empty, an empty place or two at the table where a, a brother, a son, a father was away fighting in the war. Maybe he'd come back, maybe he wouldn't. And yet, people still found hope and peace and joy and love even in the midst of those circumstances. You know, friends, we're, we're in a trying time now, a different sort of a trying time, right? With, uh, with gatherings limited from 15 to 10 to 5, and we don't know if that'll go up uh, for Christmas. If we're following some of these restrictions, it's going to mean a much different Christmas gathering. We're not going to be able to get everybody together and at least have some of that for support the way 
previous generations did to, to get themselves through hard times in the past. But if we believe and if we confess that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then, then we must believe that he was with people then, he was with people many, many years ago in ancient times, and, and he's still with us now. And this, this same Jesus, whose, whose first coming we remember, whose, whose second coming we anticipate, who, who even now dwells with us by the Holy Spirit that, that he's given to us, that indwells us, he's still the same. And that's why we can have hope instead of despair. We can have peace instead of anxiety. We can have joy instead of cynicism. And we can have love instead of fear. What I think it boils down to in the end is, is either we're living in light of the, the character and faithfulness of God as he's demonstrated many, many times by his, his saving mighty acts of faithfulness in the past, or we're living in light of just the very shifting, uh, constantly changing, uncertain realities of our present moment and our immediate surroundings. Even in a season where it seems like so many of our choices and our opportunities are limited, and I know that frustration, you all know that frustration too. We can't do this and we can't do that and we can't go here and if we do we have to fault. We can make choices though. We can make choices that will help us foster these four very important themes in this season. We can make choices that, that shape which world we're going to be living in, right? The, the world of trusting in God's faithfulness or the world of just continually shifting, changing realities that feeds our fear and anxiety. And so as we explore these four important themes, hope, peace, joy, and love in the weeks ahead, we're also going to explore some practices that might help us to make these things more real in our lives, or at least allow them to bear more fruit in our lives. You know, practices help turn these things into realities in our lives, rather than just having them be nice words that we pay lip service to. So we're going to look at some of these practices, or you might say disciplines, like generosity, simplicity, worship, and service. So I hope you'll join us this Advent season, whether you're coming to worship in person, whether we're even able to still do that for all four Sundays, we don't know. Maybe. Maybe we'll all be watching from home, but however you join with us, I encourage you to join with us, not just to hear about these things on a Sunday morning, not just to nod your head in a sense that, yes, the world is messed up, and yes, the gospel offers something better, but to, to take hold of what is offered, to practice these things, to put them into practice, as Jesus would say. Practice these things throughout each week in this season. You know, there might, be, there might be some real loss in this Christmas season ahead. I don't deny that. It might be hard. But what if this, this season, and especially these, these next four weeks or so, leading up to Christmas, what if those were also weeks of, of real, real gain, real fruit-bearing in your life, real spiritual growth? What if this was a season where your family grew in their faith in, in remarkable ways, right? You saw your kids uh, deepening in their faith, making their faith their own, asking, asking real, real solid questions that showed you how, how much they were thinking about this. What if your trust in, in the Savior and, and your conviction of his certain and sure presence with us just grew stronger and more rooted in this season ahead? What if the forces around us that were always threatening to tear us apart and pull us off in all directions and scatter us actually became the very things that pulled us closer together? And maybe it won't necessarily immediately be physically together, but together in spirit, together in love and commitment, to one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord? What if the preparations we make during this Advent season 
mean that we don't have to look back on Christmas 2020 as the worst Christmas ever, just the literal absolute worst, but instead one where we met God in just profound and deep and maybe new ways. I don't think any of that is beyond the realm of possibility. So join us these next four Sundays of Advent as we look at some tremendous and important themes uh, from God's Word. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Thanks be to God, friends. We'll see you on Sunday.